morning, everybody. Um, welcome to our um, seventh European Marine Board Forum. Um, uh, our forum is on big data in, the, in marine science. And, you know, we would have really loved to have welcomed you um, for this forum at, um, at Blue Point in Brussels. But right now, I don't think anybody wants to really uh, travel anywhere. And certainly, Brussels isn't doing so well. So, if we can have the next slide, please. So, anyway. Our, big, <clears throat> our forum is basically on um, how big data can um, enable the, the, um, the, the digital twin ocean, the um, uh, biodiversity strategy, and, and, the, and, the, um, and the Green Deal. So uh, for anybody who doesn't know me, I'm Sheila Heymans. I'm the Executive Director of the European Marine Board. And uh, next slide. Um, just some housekeeping rules. First of all, um, if you have any technical problems, please use the chat for that. There is a technical support in the chat function that you can ask any technical questions. If you have any questions, please use this question and answer um, button, which you will see at the bottom of your screen. Um, for those questions, please put your name um, and the name of your organization. You can rename yourself um, on, the, on the squares to, to put that in there, so that's helpful. But also, please state who the question is for when you're writing a question in the question and answers. Um, and then I will ask those questions out loud to the panelists um, and to the speakers when, uh, when it's question and answer time. So um, just for those of you who don't know, um, who didn't see it, uh, the, quest, the, the webinar is being recorded and it is actually being live streamed on YouTube right now. Obviously on YouTube, there's a couple of um, minutes or so delay. Um, and we will make the recording available on YouTube after the forum. So for those of you speaking, please be aware that um, you will be recorded. So for today, the agenda, we have an open session from 10 to 11 uh, Brussels time. Then we have a half an hour break where you can go and stretch your legs and get a cup of coffee. Again, we would have loved to have given you coffee here, but unfortunately you have to make your own. Um, from 11.30 to 12.30, we have a, the first session on the European Green Deal. Um, then from 12.30 to 2 o'clock, we'll have a lunch break. From 2 to 3, session 2 on the biodiversity strategy. Uh, 3 to 3, uh, 3.30, again, a break. And then from 3.30 to um, 4.45, our last session on the digital twin ocean. And we'll have a closing session that'll end just, just after 5 o'clock. Next slide, please. Um, so this is the opening session, as I said. Next slide. Um, and we will have an opening now from Gilles Leric Lericula. Again, uh, as I have said before, I'm really terrible at pronouncing people's names. So I'm um, sorry, Gilles. I know I can't pronounce your, your last name properly. Um, so Gilles is the chair of the European Marine Board. Um, and he's the acting scientific officer uh, for the French Prime Minister's General Secretariat for the Sea. Um, he was also previously the European and International Director for IFRMAR in France. So he has a really um, long standing background in understanding um, marine science. And he's actually a geologist by training. So, Gilles, over to you. Oh, thank you very much, Sheila. Um, so, again, we are very sorry not to be able to, to host you in Brussels and especially in a nice place. We were aiming at what a uh, blue point, but uh, fortunately, and that will be the topic today about uh, big data, we have the chance to have new technology and to be able to do some virtual activity and uh, to have a lot of data going through the wires and uh, going to you. And we will try to, 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 to bring some good news and activities from the European Mind Board on the subject uh, of the of the today uh, session. So I am the European Marine Board Chair. I've been elected in uh, 2019 and uh, we'll try to, to, to give you now a brief introduction to the European Marine Board and try to tell you who we are and uh, what we do. So next slide. So the, the we work on the marine science policy and tough fires. Uh, this, this is to provide advice, especially on future research and policy needs related to, to mar mar marine, marine issues. The European Marine Board is an independent and uh, self-sustaining body 
covering a wide range of marine science topics. Uh, it was established in 1995 and the European Marine Board became an independent legal entity in January 2017. The European Marine Board uh, aimed to, to have an European focus with an international outlook, but in keeping a, a national connection, of course. Next slide. The European Marine Board is a unique uh, European think tank in marine science policy based on the partner partnership of a major marine and oceanographic institute, research funding agency, and uh, also national networks of university. If we take 2020, the, the bad year, the COVID year, uh, EMB has uh, 35 members uh, covering 18 uh, European countries. Uh, that represents almost uh, 10,000 researchers and technical staff altogether. Uh, the board has recently decided to extend uh, European Marine Board uh, membership to a maximum of four members per countries in lieu of uh, three previously. So uh, for specific countries, please provide advice to your colleagues that they could uh, uh, become a, a new member of the European Marine Board. The very good secretariat, I have to say, as a chair, is con constituted of five colleagues based in Austin. So you have the picture of them on the, on the slide. And uh, I would like to recall the mission statement of the European Marine Board. So the EMB provides a pan-European platform to its member organizations to develop common priorities, advance marine research, and bridge the gap between science and policy in order to meet future marine science challenge and opportunities. Next slide. So we transfer marine science knowledge and recommendation to marine policy, but we also transfer policy questions and needs back to the marine science community. So from science strategy and foresight, we provide advices through position papers, science and policy brief, conference and forums, vision documents in order to impact the European research area. We, through research program and investment, capacity, infrastructures, and seas and oceans management, targeting the commissions, but also the, the parliaments, European parliament, national policymakers, and program management, but also the science community, and of course, the general public. Next slide. We provide our advice through events and publications. Uh, we'll give you here a rapid overview of our activities and uh, we'll start by the Eurasians, which is a multiple day conference. And it's a science policy uh, conference series, which is co-organized by the European Marine Board and the European Commission. And uh, usually we link uh, this with the, the start of the new European presidency. Uh, and we- Jill, Jill, just to interrupt, I think we don't see the slides you're talking about. Uh, can we go back? Thank you very much. Okay. It's okay? Yes, now you can go ahead. Yeah, okay. So um, the, uh, we're saying, we're talking about the Eurasian. So you have on the slide the type of Eurasian, which is a science uh, policy conference series. And as I say, it was co-organized uh, with the, the, the European Commission. And we are providing uh, uh, some call of action at the time of the European presidency. The URMB uh, forum, which is uh, one day, uh, like today, it's try to, to bridge the gap between the science community and policymakers and act as a platform for discussion and chair knowledge. Um, and we organize also uh, some uh, broad back launches, uh, which is around 1.5 hours and has it say during lunch. And uh, there are more the directed uh, debates based on a, on a specific and uh, topical area. Next slide. Okay, so, um, uh, so it's an, an overview of our current activities. So we have, we have uh, working groups. Uh, of experts who work, uh, who work with us to produce our publications, uh, position papers or other publications. And uh, the Secretariat of the European Marine Board is also um, 
active uh, uh, in uh, answering and uh, working on the European funded projects and tenders. Um, our new science webinars, and this is a, a point, a positive point due to COVID, we have organized these new science webinars. We try to present and we present the science that underpins our publications. And uh, they take place once a month, especially on the third Thursday of uh, every month. So please, uh, uh, you can uh, connect to them or you can also find them on YouTube. Uh, next slide. The, uh, we'll say that today we will focus uh, um, on big data in marine science for this forum. Uh, we had a, a working group working on this topic and it started in uh, May 2019. And we have published a, a future science brief uh, in April uh, 2020. So you, you will hear more about this document, which is the base of this today forum uh, with the, uh, um, the talk of uh, Lionel Guidi, which is uh, chair of the working group. Uh, they will talk later uh, on, the, on the subject and uh, make the introduction of this position paper. And of course, I will just recommend you to, to go on our website where you, you will find more about this uh, specific publication. In any case, you will find the publications, but more about the European Mind Board and other uh, position papers. And of course, you can follow us on Twitter. And I thank you and leave the floor and hope that forum, which is unfortunately uh, virtual, but hopefully we have this big data possibility to have it virtual. I hope it will help you to understand the link with the main topics today, especially uh, the, the willing of the Green Deal, how we can work for um, restoring or preserving our biodiversity and have a vision, especially what the big data can do for virtual activity and uh, especially twins uh, uh digital twins or uh, other numerical help to understand better our oceans and better how to preserve them for the futures and for the future generations thank you again thank you very much jill um wonderful so now we have opening remarks from um andrea stratonescu uh andrea is um I've lost my notes. Andrea is the head of maritime innovation, marine knowledge, and, and the investment unit of um, the DG Mari, the um, Director General of the Commission for Maritime Affairs and Fisheries. Um, so uh, I think Andrea has some slides. If you can share your screen, Andrea, that'd be great. Yes, I, I have the slides. And if you can give me access to share the screen, it will be appreciated. Yeah. Can we please give Andrea access? Okay, now I have it. Okay. You can see my screen? Indeed, we can. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Um, 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 it's really a pleasure to be here today with you. I think we are debating quite an important topic and um, we have good, uh, excellent opportunities in front of us if we want really to better know the ocean and what it has to offer. Um, I will present you briefly what we are doing, on which initiative we are working, but just starting, which probably everybody knows that uh, the Commission has an ambition to create a digital transformation that works for all. And here, of course, we are speaking about different solutions, um, developing really a trustworthy technology and putting people first. So um, there is already announced at the beginning of the year was announced the European data strategy and there are a lot of uh, elements uh, mentioned uh, in terms of uh, principle but also investments, skills um, and uh, of course um, uh, this will be further uh, developed. Uh, and probably you are aware that with uh, not only uh, considering the latest uh, recovery and resilience facility, we are announcing even more funds that are going to be allocated to, to this sector. So European data strategy has uh, three key objectives. First of all, of course, the technology that has to work for people, but also 
um, the, fa the fact that it needs to promote a fairer competitive economy and also uh, open democratic and sustainable so uh, society, supporting the goal of climate neutrality by 2050. Artificial intelligence, uh, a huge role to play again. First of all, the citizens have to have the confidence to embrace it, but also uh, there is a lot to be, a lot to be done uh, and to be used for everything we want to achieve in, I will say, in all the initiatives. The world that we are living in cannot uh, advance without digital. And of course, in all of this artificial intelligence, it's coming with really a huge contribution. We have just to find how we can make better use of, uh, of this with in all confidence. Now, you know as well that European Green Deal um, was announced. There are uh, a lot of objectives. I will start with the one that uh, it's really important, protecting nature. There is really the biodiversity strategy as well that came in. And we know that we are confronted with really a huge problem in terms of biodiversity, looking at the extinction rate of different species. And for all of this, we need to be able to proper, of course, uh, measures and to see what are the uh, uh, direct drivers, but also the indirect drivers that are affecting uh, um, all the changes and all the implications that we see in, in this. Um, we have the broad objective, of course, to protect 30% of the land on sea. There is quite a wide target, but it's taking also into account the specific situation in each member state, integrating corridors, ecological ones, to build coherent network. There is also from the uh, for farm to fork strategy, where uh, we are looking, of course, for an integrated view from production to consumption. And here again, looking on all the ways how um, um, what we are consuming, uh, it's produced, distributed, and uh, finally uh, used by us. Uh, we need, of course, to see how the market standards are going to be uh, revisited. And in all this picture, of course, fishery and aquaculture uh, will be considered. And again, data and uh, have an important role to play and Copernicus and Emonet, European Marine Observation Data Network, again, will be the ones that will can contribute to reduce the investment rate, risk, and of course, to facilitate the sustainable practices in this sector. Again, Emonet, probably you are aware, uh, it's a, a flagship initiative at the level of the commission. It's one-stop shop for, for reliable marine data, already a partnership which has 10 years, so 10 years anniversary this year, and already proved his effectiveness for reducing the cost and the risk in everything which is related to coastal and offshore investments. We are now going international, a uh, joint project with uh, China that begins, um, uh, um, that uh, um, started this year. And also not to be forgotten that we are supporting all the legislation uh, looking at the, um, um, all the uh, marine framework directive, but also special planning directive. So big support. Uh, we work in partnership. We do not work alone. First of all, of course, Copernicus, with, uh, with which Emonet has a memorandum of understanding, and uh, all uh, other uh, initiatives uh, around. So bringing together, uh, of course, uh, specialist uh, experts from uh, maritime field, industry, but also research. Reliable data. Uh, um, all the um, uh, the portals are giving information uh, that can be used in terms of productivity, innovation, and reducing the certainty and uh, also reducing the, the risk, the investment risks. Um, of course, what MNS try to do uh, is try to structure the data to uh, offer uh, searchable metadata and a lot of data services. So uh, it's really um, it's really a, a portal that supports the development for the future in, in the sector that uh, we want to promote. And of course, that looking at the ocean, it has an important role in order to achieve the carbonization goal by 2050. Again, Global Fishing Watch and uh, the role that Monet is playing here to support uh, all the visualization track and sharing the uh, data. Uh, so another initiative that is involved. And how we are going to support in the future, the main tool that we are going to have, of course, it's Horizon Europe. And in Horizon Europe, we have the clusters. We have a cluster on digital where Copernicus is. We have a cluster looking 
and everything which is food biodiversity, bioeconomy, natural resources, environment. And we are going to have as well a mission on healthy ocean seas, a coastal and inland waters. Partnership on climate neutral, sustainable and productive blue economy is going to come a little bit, a bit later, but also European Innovation Council, which will be a big support for all the SMEs in the sector looking at innovative solutions for all these uh, parts. So these are a little bit the clusters, a lot to be, uh, to be addressed, uh, a lot of pieces and also bigger integrated project that can be supported in order to achieve all of this. Now, uh, I think that it will be already uh, discussed uh, um, uh, later, so we are as well uh, working collaboration with initiatives that are already and projects that are uh, that have already started started at the level of the Commission. They are already running, and Blue Cloud is uh, uh, one of these. Um, so establishing establishment of the Marine Thematic European Open Science Cloud uh, with support for the Blue Economy, Marine Environment, and Marine Knowledge Agendas. As well, in the Green Deal call, the last call of Horizon 2020, there is a topic on digital twin that is going to build on all the existing EU assets, so Copernicus, Emonet, um, Erix, uh, and Blue Cloud. Um, of course, um, uh, they are going to uh, address concrete cases in local and regional sea bases. Now, Destination Earth is another one that it's currently, I would say, um, being modeled. Uh, it's looking at a very high precision digital model of Earth that is going to, of course, to uh, um, offer us the possibility to visualize, monitor and forecast natural and human activity on the planet. And of course, to support all the efforts to achieve Green Deal. So it's constructing uh, now, as I said, it's it's a model the colleagues are working on. It's a huge initiative at the level of the commission foreseen to start in 2021. Ocean Observation Initiative, it's another one that it's, uh, I will say, on the agenda um, soon, uh, probably in, uh, I will say four weeks, we will launch the public consultation. And I would like to invite all of you to contribute because the base the base principle here, of course, to measure once and use the data for many purposes in order to maximize the potential. We know that today there are a lot of observation that are happening for various purposes and we need probably to work more uh, uh, in collaboration in order to avoid waste of the resources, but also to make, to allow, uh, of course, also the member states to build and operate on infrastructure that is going to be uh, more efficient. So a big initiative that we are going to, uh, um, um, I will say, to, to shape with all um, the uh, participants who have an interest. Uh, as I said, open consultation open for three months. Quite soon, uh, we announce we announce it uh, through, uh, of course, all the channels. And for this um, maritime forum, it's really a big source of information. You can follow this uh, quite, uh, uh, quite, if I could say, on a constant basis. Now, I don't want to, to, to end without mentioning Blue Invest. Blue Invest is an initiative that we started last year. It's really, um, I would say, an excellent one because it has, um, uh, it combines the principle of um, of supporting, of coaching, um, of developing a community, community uh, that it's aiming, of course, to bring into the market innovative solutions, innovative services in the support of all the uh, activities, in all the support of all the objectives that we have for the maritime sector. And here we have the part of grants. We have the parts as well of the uh, collaboration of the European Investment Fund and the fund of the fund, because uh, European Investment Fund it's investing 75 million in additional fund to support the sector. Already the first call in terms of grants, it's, uh, uh, it's finalized. We'll soon have uh, uh, next week the kickoff meeting for the first wave. And uh, as I said uh, a little bit um, uh, before, we are supporting uh, mostly the SMEs because uh, SMEs are the one that I could say they are the most agile, but also in the, in the ones that probably need most of the support in order to, to um, bridge the value of that and to arrive into the market. So the idea is investment ready or not, if it's almost, it passes through visibility, uh, through assistance and the grants. And then if yes, of course, can go uh, through uh, fund managers 
and uh, to receive um, to receive support to uh, guarantee guarantee and equity. All of this is going to be moved forward, and starting with 2021, we we aim to enter under the big umbrella of the blue invest of the invest you sorry. So we'll have the invest you guarantee and the possibility even that more funds to be added and to support this. Till then, we have the call on 24th of November that is going to be launched an info day. Uh, a little bit the, the the condition for participations are here. I invite all of you who are interested to 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 join us. Um, you have here the details on the principal 70% co-funding. We are aiming between 0 0.7 and 2.5 million. That can be uh, can be. Uh, uh, granted. So uh, in terms of what we are doing, let's say these are the next uh, steps. And uh, with this, I will end my presentation. Um, at uh, quarter to 11, uh, I have to connect to another meeting. But if anytime there are any questions, you have my contact details and please do not hesitate to get in contact with us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andrea. Um, that's been really interesting. Okay, so now um, we are going to go uh, to Lionel Guidi. Lionel was the chair of our working group on big data, and he is a CNRS uh, oceanographer and biogeochemist at the Laboratoire de Oceanographie de Villefranche, which again, I'm not pronouncing properly. So now, Lionel, if you can share your, uh, start your video and, uh, keep, and give your talk, that's great. Yeah, thanks, Lionel. So you should see my screen now. Yes, but you're not in, yeah, there we go, perfect. So I'll try to keep the time. Thanks a lot for the uh, introduction and thanks for the previous talk that uh, put the context. Uh, so yes, I was the, the ha I was lucky to be the chair of that, uh, of that working group and I'm a, mostly a, a marine biologist, uh, not trained in big data, uh, but I, I was lucky to work with uh, a well-balanced group of computer scientists and uh, marine scientists to be able to put this uh, science brief together. So as you all probably know, the, um, this, is, was, uh, this was a timely report because uh, the ocean for the last uh, few decades uh, has been observed in very diverse ways. And, uh, and now we have means to observe the ocean in a way that couldn't be done before. We have a lot of uh, robots, sensors, uh, automatic observations, we can use remote sensing, uh, we have computational resources to be able to, to look at the ocean in a way that we couldn't do it before on the physical, chemical, and biological point of view. Um, and, as you may know as well, the, the ocean is very dynamic. Uh, it's not something that is steady. Everything is moving, everything is connected. And so it's, it's a great challenge for marine biologists, but it's also a great challenge for computer scientists. And, uh, and I think this is why I guess there is a lot of values bringing big data scientists to the ocean because they can look at this as a, a, computer, uh, as a computational uh, problem and, and try to provide solution. And it's also an innovative field for computer scientists because they're going to have to develop method to be able to look at the ocean in a way that we couldn't do it before. The purpose of the of the of the science brief was uh, to put some highlights uh, first to, to present the advance, the challenges, and the opportunity of using big data in marine science. Um, also to to, to show that we are not yet there uh, in terms of big data in marine science, but we, we have means to go there quickly. And, uh, and marine science uh, is facing a challenge of using complex data with a lot of different type of data with different natures. Um, so the way we decided to present that is using case studies uh, on climate and marine biological chemistry, habitat mapping and conservations, marine biological observation and food provisions. So I will go quickly through all these cases, but first, uh, just to, to put back some definition, uh, what is considered big data? Uh, if, you, if you want to remember that easily, it's the big five Ds. So it's uh, based on, on uh, the volume of the data, it has to be large. Uh, the, it's a large velocity also, like high frequency of data income. Um, a variety of data, complex, heterogeneous, and they have to be, you have uh, the concept of veracity as well. Uh, they need to be reliable, uh, quality check, et cetera. And finally, it's the value uh, because you want to 
take uh, things out of the data to create products to have actionable actions. Uh, so for computer scientists, uh, this is also a field where you have to develop methods. Um, just a brief overview, it's, uh, so we tend to move away from standard statistics using artificial intelligence, machine learning, that is a subfield of AI, uh, deep learning method, also a subfield of, uh, of, of machine learning and data mining. All that used together to try to solve problem and we use this method in different ways, depending on the questions. So to go back to the, to the case studies, uh, the first one is on climate uh, and marine biogeochemistry. And first, it's, it's because this is one of the most uh, challenging problems that the society is facing uh, with climate change, global warming, et cetera. And, and uh, in particular, biogeochemical observation um, have largely increased in the, fast, in the last uh, 10 years because of the automatic uh, of, of new sensors coming on the market, trying to uh, making data more and more available. Um, with that as well, the uh, uh, artificial intelligence machine learning technique came, uh, came online. And so it gave uh, ability to fill the gap of this uh, scattered observation of the biogeochemistry. And at the end, all that is used to make prediction. And uh, we need for that to integrate multiple uh, multiple type of observation and it's a very interdisciplinary field. So a good example, it's what is done in the carbonate chemistry system where uh, at the bottom of this slide here on the, on the right side, you have all the type of different observation that are currently done from ship based observation, moorings, etc. that all feed uh, data products uh, with uh, quality control, etc then it's uh, used for assimilation in models to make forecasts and all that is used uh, to help uh, making decisions and that goes back then to the strategy of getting observation new observation where when etc so that's a good example of how big data is used to inform uh, policy uh, another case study it's uh, it's about uh, the, the mapping habitats and marine conservation where, again, you have to use a lot of diverse type of information uh, to be able to produce this map and help for uh, taking decision in terms of, uh, for example, uh, designing MPA, marine protected areas. Um, this is uh, uh, currently done, and uh, and for example, it's uh, it's it's uh, it's used in the European uh, use the current infrastructure that the European uh, Open Science Clouds, where inside you have uh, virtual research environments uh, like the Everest that is uh, done for the Barry Canyon, where all the data can be gathered, used simultaneously, and to create products. Um, this is just one example, but VREs are, uh, are everywhere, everywhere now, and uh, there is a need to better connect them to be able to use all the data that are available out there. Uh, next, it's, uh, it's about the marine uh, biological observation. Um, again, this is pretty new um, because uh, first observation were done on microscope for the diversity of organisms. But more and more now with new sensors, new observation with genetics, imaging, acoustic, uh, we can uh, tackle observation of the biology uh, in a different way. And there's a lot of data uh, and it's becoming one of the most challenging uh, issue in marine uh, uh, science. It's a tr getting, uh, uh, making sense of this biological information because there's a lot coming in. And one of the big challenges that we have is marine, marine biology uh, cover a large range of organisms uh, ranging from uh, less than a micron to a few centimeters. It, just to put you that on scale, it's like if you were trying to look at uh, uh, insects, flies, and mountain at the same time, um, and, and try to assess the quality of it, the quantity, and everything about it, and their impact on, on the Earth. So this is a big challenge, and, and there, there's a lot of potential to use artificial intelligence uh, to look at organism, trying to create products, stuff like that. So, so that's a big challenge because these data are coming in and they need to be integrated with what is done before in physical oceanography and chemistry. 
And another case study is food provision. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll just talk quickly about aquaculture, but the same is true for fisheries. Um, so you have a, a good example of where AI is used actually to, to try to, to predict location and the timing of sea lice outbreak. Um, this is uh, done in aqua clouds. Um, and, and now also you have uh, in uh, the, the, the use of AI to, to, to use it as facial recognition that is done for people. Uh, for example, you could use it to, to look at uh, salmons and, and try to sort the, 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 the wild one from the farm one. And that has a lot of impact in terms of modern rivers and try to assess how much are, are coming from farm, how much are uh, from natural environments, and has a lot of impact for policy management. So all these case studies together, we try to put some recommendation that fit all these case studies actually. And, and, um, and so the recommendation are really to try to, to, to move the field of um, data science into marine science and how to make a, a, the best use of it. So the first is about data acquisition. There's a lot of sensor coming on the market and, uh, and that's a big challenge that we have to deal with. It's try to gather all this information together. The, uh, the other, uh, and we need to continue to develop this data acquisition because it provides standard measurement of uh, different parameters. Uh, the, the other one is uh, the management of the data. Uh, we have to make sure that these data are fair, usable, uh, I mean, uh, findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable. Uh, and these, uh, this is still not currently done in marine science. Uh, there's a lot of effort going there, but there's still a lot of work to do. Uh, uh, there's also a need of computational infrastructure. Uh, we have currently uh, this capacity, but they need to, to increase and to, to be interoperable. Um, data sharing is also a big issue. Uh, we need to make sure that all these data are open, uh, which is mainly true for physical uh, observation of the ocean, but biology is still not the case. And we have to work a lot in that direction to be able to, to make the best use of it. Um, and analytical needs, uh, we need to make sure that uh, data are validated. And for that, we need to develop standard algorithm uh, for, for this. And finally, um, one of the big um, issue that we are facing is that um, we are getting into this data era, but marine scientists are not trained for it. And so we need to develop special training uh, to put more and more in contact, in contact people from computer science and marine scientists to make the best use of, of, of this. And thank you. And uh, if, if you have question and if we have time, I'll be happy to, to try to answer. Thank you very much, Lunel. Um, okay, so uh, unfortunately, we are completely out of um, out of time, so <laughs> I don't think we do have time for questions. Um, and but there is a question in the question and answers. But I'm actually going to let us have Leonel, uh, uh, sorry, Linwood, Linwood's um, uh, talk first, and then the keynote, and then um, and then we'll take the questions if we have time at the end. So um, we are going to have our keynote address now from Linwood Pendleton. He is uh, the conservation and innovation advisor at the Ocean Data Foundation and Rev Ocean. Um, and he's also a global ocean lead scientist at WWF. Um, he holds positions at the European Institute for Marine Studies, Duke's uh, Nicholas Institute for Environmental Policy Solutions, and the University of Queensland's Global Change Institute. He gets around. Um, so we are going to play a video. This way we might actually um, stick to time for a change. Um, and um, you'll see that the video has, um, you know, it'll have a Linwood's voice and artwork by um, uh, oh, I forgot the name of the, the, the person, uh, Adam. Data promises to transform how we measure and observe the ocean. While the technical challenges of big ocean data are significant, the human challenges associated with the interpretation, use, and effectiveness of big ocean data are equally daunting and perhaps less well understood. I want to explore some of these important human issues associated with big ocean data and talk about ways to address these challenges. In 2016, at a future oceans meeting in Kiel, Tosti Tano and I manned the big data table at a World Cafe session. At our table, we asked just one question, what is big data? Some said that big data 
is massive amounts of historical data. Others said it was streaming data from satellites and buoys, more like our current definition of big data. But many at the time said big data were really crazy data from Instagram, supermarket scanners, and mobile phones. And not everyone was convinced then that big data were real data, or at least useful data. Whether or not we agree on what constitutes big data, there is no doubt that we are in fact living in a big data world, where our understanding of what it is, where it comes from, and how it can be used is evolving fast. This unavoidable baptism in big data is being driven by rapid changes in how we observe the Earth and measure the ocean. We've seen dramatic increases in the number of sensors for monitoring the ocean using both public and private assets. We have new classes of private research vessels and yachts, drones and gliders, hydrophones, and satellites and planes that can view coral reefs underwater using hyperspectral imagery. We've also seen a phase shift in the kinds of people and institutions that want to collect and share data. Of course, institutional data sets are increasingly available online. Scientists, especially younger scientists, are more willing and happy than ever to share and be fed directly to large-scale institutional databases. Similarly, many maritime industries are eager to collect and share their data from ferry boxes, offshore platforms, cable installations, and from ocean expeditions whose primary goal may have been more for private gain than public edification. And of course, citizens are now also major sources of ocean data. Open sourcing allows people to build their own AUVs and gliders, to run their own water quality testing, and to use their phones to document biodiversity and water conditions. And huge amounts of data are being collected by ordinary people, even without their knowledge, through geo-tracking by apps and fitness devices, and through social media. This explosion of ways of measuring the ocean is contributing not only to big data and broad data, but the democratization of data collection. And this means that big data is not only bigger and faster than old data, it also means that the human side of big ocean data is more heterogeneous and complex than ever. The European Marine Board's recent brief on big ocean data makes it quite clear that big ocean data is now a way of life and its promises are enormous. What is less clear though, is who is in control in this new world? What will we do with all these data? And whether public processes to manage the big data revolution can even keep up. Cloud storage companies like Amazon, Google, and Microsoft are in the process of putting massive amounts of data from NOAA online and in the cloud. There are new private ocean data sites and public-private hybrids like the Ocean Data Platform. And of course, there's the crowd in the cloud, a term I thought I made up, but in fact, it's a citizen science webpage and portal. But more importantly, it's also a movement to give more regular people the ability to contribute, use, and potentially meddle with the new big data ecosystem that is evolving around us. The European Marine Board Policy Brief on Big Ocean Data does a very good job of describing the promise of big data and the technical challenges ahead. But we've only begun to understand the true human challenges that lie ahead for the world of big ocean data. It's these challenges I want to touch on in my remaining time. One of the biggest challenges we face in the coming years may simply be making sense of what we learn from big data. Big data will provide a new way of viewing the world, but big data are not the world. Big ocean data are not the ocean. Big data are the light through a new lens for us to observe, perceive, and hopefully better understand the ocean and people. Plato described the dissonance between the real world and the world we as humans perceive by telling the story of people who live their lives in a cave. Their reality of the world was the shadows they saw on the cave wall. For them, these shadows seemed to be reality. In a sense, the scientific approach is not so different from Plato's cave. Data and theory have been the shadows we use in the scientific process to get our heads around how the world works. Now, with big ocean data, we're starting to see new, more vivid, and faster changing shadows. But these are still just projections of the world as we've learned to see it. And as a result, we must always question and test what we see. And what we see may be confusing. Gone are the days of Occam's razor and the KISS principle where we were told to keep it simple. Big data is about embracing the complexity of the world 
But we have to ask, are we capable of grasping what we're seeing and learning? Is our understanding shared? Do we all place the same trust in what we see in the data? If the answers to these questions are no, no, and no, then can we use these big data to make collective and public decisions? There will be a lot of heterogeneity in how we embrace big data. Big data will surely not fit into all ways of knowing and thinking. Will big data have a role in indigenous knowledge systems? And when? The analytics of big data will reveal new insights into how the ocean works, but not all of the new insights will be correct. We have to be particularly careful about how we interpret our findings to see what lies below the surface, so to speak. New patterns that are revealed to us through big data analysis may only be locally applicable. Perhaps they reflect patterns and relationships from the past that won't hold in the future. Some patterns and relationships may simply be wrong, artifacts of when, where, and how we collected data. And of course, correlation is not causation. Policy is about controlling one variable, hoping to influence another. With big data, it may be difficult to discern drivers from mere correlates, making it difficult to use our findings to inform policy. Because of the newness of big ocean data analysis and because of its complexity, building trust in the data and what we learn from it will be critical. Without that trust, really what good is big ocean data? Building trust requires that we always acknowledge the limitations of these data. For instance, we must begin by acknowledging openly that our big data are biased. That indeed is a fact. Yet bias only appears once in the European Marine Board brief on big ocean data. Bias in big data is nothing new. Many of you know the story of the 1936 U.S. election in which the Literary Digest conducted a survey of 2.3 million voters, the biggest data collection ever at that time, and predicted that Landon would soundly defeat Roosevelt for the presidency. Of course, Roosevelt won in a landslide. The Digest was wrong because its data came from mailed surveys and they used a list of national automobile registrations as the mailing list. In other words, only rich people were sent the surveys and only rich people answered the surveys. The sample was biased, and the conclusions that were drawn were wrong. Generally, with big ocean data, we face two kinds of bias. First, our data are unrepresentative. We don't collect data everywhere or all the time. Second, our data reflect our previous biases. We either collect the data we can or the data we collected in the past to test our old ideas. And we definitely don't collect big data for all the variables we need. And that's basically because we create hypotheses around what we experience, and then we collect data to test these hypotheses. This becomes a self-reinforcing view of the world. It's very difficult to fully exploit out-of-the-box insights that can come from big data if our data are from inside the box, just faster and bigger. The potential for bias in human big data may be equally problematic. The EBM brief focuses mainly on big oceanographic data, but big human data, that is data about people and what they do, are going to be important for understanding ocean change and how it affects humans. For human big data, we collect more data from connected users, which creates a bias against less connected people, a type of digital divide. Currently, we often fail to collect big data that reflect local indigenous knowledge, creating still more bias. And what happens if people, say unsustainable fishers, opt out of data collection altogether? Nothing erodes trust more than telling the world you are right, only to be proven wrong. A great benefit of streaming data combined with machine learning analysis is the ability to understand change quickly and to respond. Yet these same qualities mean the potential for jumping to the wrong conclusion is higher than ever, all the while thinking we've made our decision based on evidence and data. It's for this reason that the International Accord for Open Data calls for diligence in testing big data, testing our findings, and self-correcting constantly. In his book, Thinking Fast, Thinking Slow, Daniel Kahneman explains how humans can overcome their biases and trust their own reasoning. He describes our brains as two information and decision systems. 
The first system makes us quick to judge. This is the system that helps keep us from being eaten by lions or hit by cars. The second is a slower system and it weighs data more carefully. This is the system we engage before we buy a house or decide to move to a new country. With training and experience, we can learn to disengage our system one and replace it with system two. We need to figure out what safeguards we can put in place, what practices need to be adopted to help us slow down and weigh big data more carefully. This includes big ocean data. We must always test our findings and our predictions. The third pillar of trust is quality. One of the questions I hear often about our work at the Ocean Data Platform is, how will you guarantee the quality of the data? As if there were some sort of well-defined gold standard for all data. I think that's the wrong question, because while we have lots of standards for data, ultimately the measure of the quality that's needed depends on the question to be answered. If we limit ourselves to only high quality data, we run the risk of ignoring important information. Two things are needed to address issues of quality in a big ocean data world. The first step to address quality concerns is that big data must always be put in context. Contextualization means understanding the three-dimensional and time relationships of data. The world is not flat and neither is the ocean. Contextualization also means putting big oceanographic data in its human context. This means combining big data sources with broad data sources data about policies, economic activities, human behavior, and indeed human beings. Of course, adding these broad data to big data just adds to the challenges of complexity I've described earlier. More complexity and more sources of data also makes it increasingly difficult to understand how various data sources and data of widely varying quality and rigor influence our decisions, which leads to the second step in quality assurance. In addition to contextualization, we need transparency to build trust in data quality. This requires that we track and show the provenance of data. We can't just bury people in a wave of data. It's essential that everyone knows where our data come from and what influences different data sources play on our findings. To do this, we need to go beyond simple DOIs for databases. We need tags that reflect key metadata for the individual datum in our databases. Tags that can help us do sensitivity analysis about the effects of data sources on our findings. These tags will also help with trust through the data chain. With better data tagging, data providers don't need to relinquish full control over their data. They can see who uses their data, potentially alert users if problems are found or updates are made. And with tags, we can begin to create data impact factors to reward those who share their data. Data tags will be essential for guaranteeing data transparency in a big ocean data world. We have to recognize that there's always fear of the unknown and untried, and many people are rightly afraid that the big data future means we will simply be buried in a sea of useless data our ability to collect data may exceed our ability right now to understand and use it. We can't just create lots of big data and hope people figure out how to use it. The science to policy paradigm is dead. Policy and decision making must be integrated into data collection from the start. The coming century must be one of collaboration where decision makers at all levels from, from consumers to planners and prime ministers can work with scientists to determine what evidence is required to plan for a sustainable future. I know it feels like I've touched on a lot of topics, but I really have just one main message. To unlock the power of big ocean data requires trust and you build that trust the way you do in any scientific relationship. Question everything you see and question your findings and be open for discussion about them. Be humble and open to the fact that everyone will view big data differently. Slow down and try not to be seduced 
by the fast pace of streaming data. Be transparent in all that you do. Collaborate, collaborate, collaborate. And finally, always give credit by tracking the provenance of data, giving credit to those who share their data, and provide clear ways for people to investigate how data from different sources influences your findings. I think if we do these six things, we can build trust in big ocean data and unleash the power of big ocean data to help us achieve a sustainable and productive ocean. I want to thank Adam Martinakis for his artwork and Anna Zivian for her poem. And I want to thank you for listening to this talk. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, so we are seriously behind time. So I'm actually not going to take any questions right now. I'm going to go straight to the next uh, thing on the agenda, which is a brief introduction um, by the uh, young amb ambassadors. So uh, the Marine Board has um, young ambassadors and they are going to give you the user's perspective. So supporting the ocean system with integrated big data. Uh, we have four young ambassadors, but um, Alessandro is, can't be here. The, the four, three that are here is Natalia Dunik uh, from the Institute of Oceanography, Oceanography and, and Fisheries in uh, Croatia, uh, Alba Gonzalez from the Spanish Institute of, of Oceanography in Spain, and Liam Lax from Newcastle University in the UK. And if you guys can put your video on, if they're not on yet, um, and uh, I'll leave it to you. Thanks very much, Sheila. Thanks. Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thanks very much for joining us here today. Um, I'm sure at this stage from these talks that you've heard already, uh, you're very well aware that we're living through the digital revolution. And some are even calling this the third industrial revolution. Even the fact in itself that we're all together here today with this common interest, this common goal, yet we're separated by thousands of miles. It's an absolute testament to the unprecedented new opportunities available to humankind. We have a plethora of rapidly advancing technologies. Models of our climate and ecosystems are ever more accurate and the most detailed and extensive observations of our world, our societies and our oceans are being recorded, the most detailed and extensive in human history. This gives us the power to reach new levels of understanding of our oceans, and the people who rely on it, but it also brings with it the responsibility to use these new technologies, to make the most out of them, and to use them to benefit both our society and our environment, our oceans. To fully understand the ocean, we need to consider them across different dimensions, across spatial dimensions, from a single beach where any one of us might have gone for a walk, seen a storm coming in from the sea, watched a beautiful sunset, to regional oceanographic processes like the annual upwelling um, of the Benguela current, which is bringing nutrient rich water and causing one of the most productive parts of our seas. To the global ocean conveyor belt, it's extending from the surface of the oceans right to the depths, mediating our climate across all corners of the earth. We also have to consider the ocean in a temporal dimension from the daily flux of light cycles to the monthly push and pull of the spring neap cycle, and further decadal and centuries long changes in our ocean systems and marine ecosystems. These, these long-term changes are now happen, happening rapidly and, and ever more rapidly. But we also have to think about social dimensions and observational dimensions. We need to consider the oceans from all different disciplines, from all different perspectives, scientific, sociological, philosophical, from all walks of life. But putting all of this highly complex information together to find actionable solutions to different issues and uh, move toward more sustainable, sustainable ocean usage, it's a hugely difficult task. We're only human. Each of us can only specialize in a certain field. We can only work in a certain region, can only sample on certain occasions. But luckily, we're not alone. Technology is our best ally in our quest to understand the ocean. And Liam, you are right. Technology has evolved dramatically over the past few decades, allowing us to design new ways to collect the data coming from the ocean. 
And one thing is sure, the big data era in oceanography is here and this is new. Historically speaking, to get the data, oceanographers went on a boat, and you all know boats are expensive. Well, they would sink a sensor like a thermometer or put a thermosalinograph on a boat, and they would wheel it back up or just read it, and everybody would get a number. And that number was and still is important. Today, development of the autonomous system gave us uh, floats and different remote system, and now we are getting uh, more and more of these important numbers and new a massive amount of data is still yet to come. The data that will include uh, new variables such as socioeconomic ones in a light of a new change in climate changes. When it comes to numerical modeling, it is even worse. We now use a computer to try to simulate what an ocean does and we are doing that on a large numerical grids. And we want to do that on a climate scale, not just for a few years. And we want to do that several times so we can make some sort of a statistics of it. And this is all resulting in a huge amount of data. Getting all this data together today is a challenge. Most of the new techniques designed to visualize the data are not designed to include three or more thousands of series that are actually spatially and temporally varying. Even scientists today are using a variety of simulation codes, analyzing tools, visualization tools, and databases that are typically quite different, each of them having a different file format. If you are a scientist, you would want to spend a significant part of your time to do the science. To be honest, you would want to spend the most of your time to do the science. And in reality, this is not the case. In reality, a scientist is trying to keep track of whether uh, time format is um, part of a calendar that is defined as uh, seconds from January 1st, uh, 1960, or as the hours from January 1st, 1950. Most of our time uh, is actually spent on unifying the inconsistent formats of different data sets. And in light of this, I would like to say that we need to develop skills to find a better and a simpler way to analyze and visualize all the data that we already have. And I would like to leave you with a thought uh, that biodiversity is not only one of the keywords when it comes to the ocean, the diversity is also visible among us humans who are trying to understand all the new changes in OSHA that are still yet to come. And if we think about it, you can see that there are different types of so-called end users of the ocean big data. And actually these end users are the key factors to define a true path of the big data. Thank you both and good morning. So to wrap things up, uh, when we think about um, uh, the future of our careers in the decades to come, uh, we imagine a world where there are two global oceans. One is the real life ocean that we all know, and the other one is a virtual ocean that holds um, all the knowledge gathered by millions of scientists and machines across the world and through times um, where um, Real-time data can be con continuously uploaded and also in situ data can be included for constant calibration and, and validation. Um, this virtual ocean that we imagine would be unified in format, like Natalia said. Uh, it would be collaborative and of course, open access. Um, this would allow us to have a good idea of what's going on in at any given time or place in the ocean from the safety of our office or our home. And this would, will allow us to, for example, react more quickly to natural hazards to protect our cities and save lives, or to make uh, more accurate predictions with future trends to make better choices. Um, we are going into the um, United Nations decade of ocean science. And by the end of this decade, uh, some of these scenarios that we imagine may have come true and others may not. But maybe we will also have other novel technologies that we can't even imagine right now. So we are looking forward to discovering all those. Finally, some people wonder if the development of big data, machine learning, and artificial intelligence will eventually put us out of work. But for us, technology is not a competitor, it's a collaborator. Our philosophy is very straightforward. 
leave to the machines what only machines can do and leave to the humans what only humans can do. For example, only machines or technology can collect continuous real-time data and upload them automatically, and especially keep, connect, keep collecting this data regardless of any circumstances that can be limiting to humans. Like for example, let's say a pandemic that doesn't allow us to go out and do our field work. But on the other hand, only humans can validate and analyze this data, formulate hypotheses, solve problems, make good policies, and in general, collaborate to create a better tomorrow. So it's clear that the digital revolution is already here. So our final question from us to all of you is, are we ready to make the best out of this digital revolution? That is all, thank you so much. Wonderful, thank you very much. You three have really put it uh, in perspective for us, I think. Um, so I see that we are officially five minutes behind schedule and we've not asked any questions yet. Um, so I, I'm sure some people might have to go and, uh, you know, get a cup of coffee, but I am going to take a few questions um, which have come in. Um, and the first question that came in was from Laura Fleming, and it was basically, how could you imagine, let me bring it here so you guys can see me, how could you imagine the potential benefit of integrating human health and well-being data into the ongoing collection of ocean data, both in terms of collecting collection analysis and better integration of policy and training? Um, so, Laura, um, that's a great question. I think uh, um, in his uh, plenary, Luna uh, uh, Linwood basically uh, mentioned some of that, but I know that um, Jill wanted to answer um, that question. So, Jill, over to you. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Laura, for, for these questions. But uh, as we are out of time, I won't go the deeper, but I recommend you to go to our uh, policy brief, which has been published by the European Marine Board. And we addressed exactly your questions, which is I recommend to that you read the policy needs for ocean and human health. And you will see that the, 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 the brief uh, a, a summarized the policy challenge uh, uh, one attending to address both ocean and human health together. And the, 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 the data, the recommendation on, uh, related to data indicators for ocean and human health is well addressed inside. So I stop here because we are running out of time, but I recommend you it's on the European Marine Board uh, website and you can find it very easily. It's policy needs for ocean and human health. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jill. And I see that Linwood has put in the chat to the panelists that collecting human health data like other human data help demonstrate the so what of ocean change. And I think that's a very good point. Um, okay, I'm going to take a question that came from Riza Meyer to Lionel specifically on the recommendations that you presented. Which one would you say would um, pose the biggest challenge? I know that you've answered it um, uh, in text, but maybe you want to also um, give it in word. Yeah, quickly, it's, it's really hard to say which one is the biggest. Uh, for sure, the first one is still data, data management. Uh, there's a lot of progress done on that field, but still, it's the first one to tackle if we want to address the other one. So I would say that. Thank you very much. Um, and then there was a question from Honor Akdas. So I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. Uh, you mentioned that citizens are the fundamental data source for the ocean data. Do you think that the target citizens uh, should be coastal residents and does it make a difference regarding the data? And I think Linwood wanted to answer that. So Linwood, over to you. Okay. I, I wouldn't say they're a fundamental source, but they're an important source, especially for places and things that we can't monitor regularly. Um, and that includes many near shore areas, estuaries, um, but it also includes biodiversity and plastic, which are still very difficult to monitor. I think uh, citizen science data is also really important for understanding human uses of the ocean. And because there are many marine ecosystem services that leave the sea and are transported inland, um, I don't think we want to limit ourselves just to the coast. There's a lot of data in passive citizen science data. So if you think about all the images that are shared online, there are many, many pictures that have biodiversity in it, have indications of water quality and ecosystem health. I think we have to get really creative and we have to help citizens do a better job of collecting good data that we can use. 
Thank you very much, Linwood. I think those are all the questions that I see. Um, so um, we are a little bit late, but uh, nevertheless, I think we have a 20 minute break now. So um, thank you very much to our panelists. Thank you very much to the opening speeches. And I think um, it's been a really interesting morning. Uh, I would suggest you all go and have a cup of coffee now. Um, and uh, we will hopefully the, the new uh, panelists for the European Green Deal session um, will be there so we can just check um, that we can see you and, uh, you know, hear you. So um, for those of you that are online, you'll also see us testing, but it should be fine. Um, and yeah, we'll, um, we'll see you at 12.30.